Good day, everybody. Welcome to Canadian music in the 80s and 90s and more. A, thanks for watching. Um, please subscribe if you like the channel. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome back Laurie Yates. Thanks for joining me again, Laurie. Oh, wow, thanks for having me back. We have a we have a reason though. Um, I'm really excited to tell everybody about you sent me your new CD. Um, it just came out fairly recently. Yeah, Um officially uh, January 29th, so. So yeah. um, when did this come about? Like, I mean, it's been a while since you've actually released something, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Funny how that happens. You know, I meant to release <laughs> every two years and then boop, all of a sudden it's eight years in between releases. Um, It was a COVID record. It sort of started. Um, honestly, I wasn't thinking of recording. I was mm -hmm. in the, you know, the, the depths of COVID despair, like everybody. Yeah. And I started to do a live stream Tuesday night uh, Facebook uh, kind of gig. And from that, these songs started to form and, and a whole kind of community started to form around the live stream. And, you know, they, they I could kind of tell which songs were favorites and which songs people mm -hmm. liked and, and people were, you know, giving me their opinions on the songs. So um, there's nine songs on that record and seven of them are new from that time period and two of them are old from my Can't Stop the Girl record. So so and in that time uh, i started to uh then go sneak over to the blue rodeo studios and record them during that time as well well that kind of leads to my next question which you kind yeah. of answered but um i was just going to say like how old is some of the material is it stuff you've been working on for a while or was it fairly new rights like like they were um well they all were new rights except for time after time the co-write that i did with guy clark uh, was from 1989 when I with my Can't Stop the Girl record, my Sony Nashville record, okay. uh, and my the song Cowboy, which was a song that I um, wrote before I went to Nashville. It's one of mine, and uh, so those were two older songs that I re I wanted to re-record because I felt that they uh, the Guy Clark tune just didn't really get the attention that I thought it deserved with the record right. coming. I don't even think it got released as a as a single it, it didn't and you know since he's passed away he he's really um got you know been given kind of you know and and deservedly so like you know legendary status as a songwriter and he was when he was alive right. um so i wanted to do it again and um and then but all the other ones are new except for rage within me the very first verse of that song is a is the very first verse I ever wrote from really? a song. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, I I would write uh, before I could play an instrument. I would sing the the songs. I would sing them, and they would come to me as songs, or or melodies, I guess, and words. And um, I had started writing poetry like when I was about eleven, but um, I uh, I had had those words around for many, many, many years, like since I was about yeah. eighteen. And I just would, I would return to them and they, I couldn't ever finish the song. I just couldn't finish. I couldn't find a place to put them in. It just felt, it felt disingenuous. I'm like, oh, mama, mama. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mama, mama, I'm from Canada. Like I'm from yeah. Ontario. We don't, yeah. we don't say mama. We don't, like we're, that's not how I speak. I'm like, I always call my mom, mom or ma. Yeah. But, and I always wanted to be genuine to my type of, uh, speech and language right and that was one of that's always been one of my dilemmas with country music about yeah. where I'm from you know uh because I I'm not I'm not southern so mama doesn't make sense to me but there it was and anyways I was able to I, I picked it up one day and there it was I was able to fit it into the song I just decided to allow itself to be finished <laughs> that's the way I looked at it anyway that's yeah. awesome it sounds like it was yeah. a lot of fun to put together like so overall how long did it take to put this like together to get like an actual concept for an album like and it was a while it was a long it was during covid right so right. it was it felt like it was in sloth years it just felt like it, was like, yeah. it just felt like <laughs> it maybe it wasn't that long but it felt long it felt drawn out um, well, that, that was the one thing we had during COVID was time oh, my <laughs> to, God. to take our time and do what we wanted to do, right? Uh, I mean, I would go in there and, you know, I didn't even go with a plan. Like, usually, 
when you record, you you have you you have your set of songs, you have your player. It's very organized because it's expensive, right? Yeah. You don't want to be in there bumbling around because it costs a lot of money. Um, I was given a great opportunity as an old friend of Lee Rodeo's. They, you know, very graciously offered me their their studio for their like come on in, right? Um, and I got to work with uh, the engineer Tim Vesley of the Rio Statics. He engineered it, and we, you know, we'd we'd been like we'd sort of known of each other, of course, from the early '80s in Toronto on the music scene, but never worked together, never really knew each other. So, yeah. um, you know, working with him um, was a new adventure, you know, and I would um, kind of present him with ideas. I wouldn't really have a, an idea for what I wanted. And I would just sort of leave them, you know, and say, I, I, I'm not really sure what to do. And I never usually would do that either. I, I was yeah. much more of a control freak or have a solid idea when I worked on other records and you know he had a different much more of a pop sensibility on stuff than me yeah so um yeah i would come back and like for instance like magdalena he would have these great grooves and uh i was, I was blown away by it so i just kind of let him do his thing i loved it and and, well, and with some of the stuff you know i had a, a pretty clear idea but others i didn't well, he's a pretty good guy to let you do that, to do that with, I guess, like, you know, because he's yeah. got quite a track record himself yeah. as an artist as well. And um, Yeah. So he ended up like he was the, you know, the accidental co-producer because we didn't start out like that. We didn't start, oh, okay. I didn't start out to be like, OK, Tim, you're going to be the co-producer. Like there was no there was no um, uh, titles. There wasn't like you're the co-producer, da, 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 da. not at all. Nothing like that. It was just I'm going to come and record and. We're not really sure how this is. We just took it yeah. really session by session. Yeah. So did you record it with everybody together or was it a more like a lot of people record now they record, they send files to people and then they send files back. Like, did you have everybody together when you could to record? Um, well, with the, the tracks, the band tracks um, that had Hey Stella, that had Michelle Joseph, David Baxter and Basil Donovan on it. Yeah, those those three tunes that are on there with the full band, they all were in the studio that day. Okay. Um, but the rest of them, uh, Jimmy Boskill uh, from Blue Rodeo as well, and his own, of course, great career. Um, and uh, Steve O'Connor, who plays with Jim Cuddy. Okay. They they flew their tracks in. Yeah, I, they just flew their tracks. Because it was COVID, right? Yeah. And, and we everybody got used to doing that. And that yeah. was one of the great benefits. Like if there was anything good that came out of that, was that, was that mm -hmm. we could suddenly, you know, you could do a guitar track or, and send it into a studio and there it was. So um, only the band tracks those two days that we recorded. Otherwise, everybody else flew everything all soon. Awesome. Um, and Kara, Kara Manovich came in to sing as well. Yeah, it's very, it's very well put together. And I'm guessing... The Matador cover really gets a lot of, I mean, old school Toronto musicians talking and yeah, and you yeah. know, I mean, the title track, like the the song Matador, is obviously about the club, and a lot of people yeah. have some serious memories about what it was like back in those days, like, and obviously that's what the song's about. Um, so do do you remember quite a bit about hanging out? Yeah, there? I I do. I mean, I probably came to it late i wasn't um i wasn't a super regular mm -hmm. but i did uh i mean the first time i i was at the matador was probably the early 80s and i was there with my guitar player from my my punk new wave band the last resorts we showed up in our leather jackets <laughs> and uh you know our ramones leather jackets and and nice. dunn the owner she looked at us and she said you know this is a country bar and we <laughs> said yeah we know we know and then we went and, you know, it was the kind of place that opened after last call and they sold Mickey's under the table <laughs> and there was always great musicians playing and they'd be playing usually country music, but whatever kind of, or rock music on an elevated stage. It was a great big bowling alley uh, sized room, huge with wooden floors. Everybody would dance, um, bingo bingo sized tables like big you know um 
you know, 12 people could sit at a table yeah. and it would be packed and everybody would show up after last call and leave usually at six in the morning. <laughs> they, they served like hot dogs and chili, which can be get kind of messy, but, um, and there was never like, it wasn't like a violent place. I don't ever remember it being like that. So yeah. that was the first time I showed up there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. The second time, a um, little bit of a different story. Fast forward a few years from that, probably before I was known as a famous singer anyways, and showed up very drunk with a very drunk boyfriend. And we go, I tap the guy on the shoulder. I, go, I want to sing. I want to sing. They're like, okay, okay. Uh, they let me come up. While I'm up on stage singing, I look and there's my boyfriend who's like the same size as me, about five foot two. He's getting thrown down the stairs. <laughs> and I'm like, I run off the stage, the gigantic bouncer, he says to me, well, what did you do? You're not looking after him. I'm like, oh, my God. And they throw us out. Not <laughs> good. So then the third time I show up, it's for, uh, by now I'm, you know, I'm a known singer. And uh, it's Katie Lang's, um, they're doing a, a video shoot for her. Okay. I walk in there and Ann Dunn, the owner, says, she goes, I know you. I know you, we threw you out of here last time you were here. <laughs> and uh, I always remember her words and I didn't know what she was talking about at the time. She said, it just takes one song, Lori, one song. That's all it takes. And I thought, what is she talking about? I did not know what she was talking about. Well, I know what she's talking about now. You know, it, it just takes one song to make your career. That's all it takes. But at it's least to, to kickstart a career, right? It takes more than that usually to hold on to one, but you know, um, it, yeah. So that was my, so then I started to um, play there and go there a lot when I um, was hanging out with Basil Donovan from Blue Rodeo. Okay. Um, he was kind of like their adopted son and he was playing there all the time. And so everything that's in the song is factual. Like their yeah. daughter, Charmaine, she did work the door. Leonard Cohen, you know, he was you know, the legends like hung out there. Um, Johnny Lovson played there all the time. Basil was in a new wave band in the early eighties and would, you know, yeah. got and Ann Dunn did come and cut his hair off. They put it in, <laughs> they they framed it. Um, you know, Jean, the cowboy girl, the cowboy dancer, she um she was this fantastic dancer. She's still around, she's on my Tuesday night um live streams often. Uh, she would dance. We'd all watch her because she was so fantastic. And she she ran a, a little clothing boutique within the club called Kitty Galore. And Zita sold hot dogs. Like it's all it's all factual. Factual what actually happened in there. And and then the 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 chorus is really a call of like when Ann Dunn had it from 1964 to 2003, I guess. Um, and then she sold it. A month later, she passed away at 81. So um, when she, once it was closed, you know, little did we know what we had lost. Or maybe yeah. we did realize, I don't know. But it was, a, it was a very special place that when any touring artist from Pink to Joni Mitchell to anybody who did a big concert here, that's where they were taken. Because it was so different and cool and unique unto itself, right? Um, and everybody played there as well. So the stars would get up and sing if they wanted to, or they just hang out. And uh, it was just a really, really cool place. So once it closed, a guy bought it. He tried to make a go of it um, with to make it to keep it a club, but somehow he didn't. He didn't buy the right, right. something that was I don't know. It got it turned into a mess. So guess what? It's going to be now. It's Toronto. What do you think it's going to be? <laughs> the condo, probably. That's right. That's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't That's take no long idea. to come up with that guess, did it? No, no. no. Um, I, it's almost like you're taking a page of Stomp and Tom's book there, writing a song like that, because that'd be, that'd be something he might have done. You know, write Maybe. a song about a play. I mean, he wrote a song about the Horseshoe Tavern back in the day, but yeah. And I, I believe Stomp and Tom played there several times. He sure did. Yeah, he sure did. And I think there's actually a famous story about Ann Dunn, which I should look up, Ann Dunn telling Stomp and Tom to get off the stage or, or they're fighting. Because I think there was, a, <laughs> yeah, 
no, I think because he's like, I'm not playing here unless it's country. And she said, well, then you're not playing here. There was something like there was some kind of fight that went on because she was feisty, right? She was like, yeah, a little feisty lady, but. He he was pretty feisty himself, I guess. Yeah, too. Really? So, <laughs> okay. I know they had a yeah. couple of his comebacks or whatever there. Like I know that he was he came out of retirement there, and I remember much music did a story about it. And, right. and Murray right. McLaughlin was there, so was Dave Bedini. Yeah. Um, I would have thought maybe you were there too, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I no, I I, I don't think I was. Well, no, I don't think I was. No, no. But yeah, he played there quite a bit when he came out yeah. of retirement. And it was yeah. just, I was just amazed to see him in the spotlight again after so many years. But yeah, yeah. but I mean, that's, I mean, it's good that people can write a song like that still, because I think it's kind of like what he always wanted. He always wanted artists to do more songs about where they're from in Canada and stuff right. like that. And that's like a perfect example of the kind of song I yeah. think he was looking for. And hmm, it's great that it's great that you wrote it. It's um it's amazing piece and i think it's probably there's a lot of other musicians probably listening to this record and thinking the same thing you know i i mean i didn't do it on purpose no. I, now i've somebody said you're writing songs about bars <laughs> and I went, oh you're right because i've got one about the cameron i've got one about the cork town and i've got one about the the matador and I said, <laughs> like i've never set out to do that i i i can never i never used to be able to write story songs at all Oh really? No, no, no. They baffled me. I was I I wrote songs about feelings, feelings, yeah. and I I didn't know how you did that. And then one I don't know when I found out either, but um, I know that once I tapped into it, that's all I wanted to do, really. Yeah. And um, and you know I that song I was singing it around the house. The tear it down, don't tear it down, tear it down, don't tear it down. Yeah. Um, and my husband, Gary, he said, that's great. And I said, really? And he said, that's great. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would never have known it from any of the other, you know, 25 songs I've got going. I wouldn't, I would, I like them all, you know, but yeah. he's like, oh, that's a great one. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And that's and 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 also you know the, the video um have you seen the video i haven't yet oh i'll send it to you uh, it's I'll, very... put it, I'll put it in the uh, description on okay. youtube when i post it because it's very um uh toronto uh, mid 80s like my band rank tangles in it uh handsome yeah. ned's in it the bobcats jack uh, Kaiser, mean steve piano uh leslie spit trio molly johnson it's all 80s mid Mid eighties, oh, that's Toronto. awesome. It, which you know, it's not everybody. Blue Rodeo when they're first starting, um, but it's very Toronto centric at, at that time. Yeah, and and, to, and interestingly enough, there wasn't a lot of um, Matador footage. Couldn't find any footage of Anne Dunn. Like it was so weird. Like to actually find, you know. So, but it, but it's a fun fun video, and people loved it. They loved it, and and we loved it too. So. Oh, it would be. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, just some of the bands you named in there, yeah. Leslie Spit Trio and Molly yes. Johnson. I remember yes. Molly yeah. Johnson singing with Tom Cochran in one of her videos. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I love the infidels. They were oh, probably one of the most underrated bands I think Canada oh, yeah. ever produced. Oh, yeah. Like well, the, the the shot that's in the video is, is of Molly in the Infidels, and she's just like her it's her looking up, and it was uh one of my all-time favorite songs of it, of uh, the infidels. Yeah, yeah she was one of the most eclectic singers. Like, I mean, she oh, could absolutely. sing rock and roll. She could sing blues. Yes. I remember hearing yeah. her sing jazz a couple of oh, times, yeah. and oh yeah, just amazing yeah. to have. Yeah. Oh, that's an amazing collection of people to be yeah. together. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, any plans for any shows coming up? Like, you're gonna do to promote um, it more? Or are you gonna yeah. I mean, go I'm on just, the road, um, maybe. Or well, you know, I'm just I'm looking into all that stuff. I've got um kind of what's happening because this records it's it's a it's not really a band record right and yeah. um so i've got a lot of um solo type shows happening right now yeah. and um so i've got one in toronto at a, a bookstore uh called excuse me sellers and newell on um march 30th which is okay. at i think it's college and clinton i'm playing um okay. then i'm i'm back in hamilton on which is so great uh, Hamilton, the Hamilton Spectator just did a big article, a full page article about me leaving Hamilton. It made me cry my eyes out. Um, because I got so much great like 
feedback about, you know, we miss you, Lori. Thank you for what you did. Because in the article, I'm like, I didn't want to leave. Because I didn't. But I it was just circumstances I had to go. Like, I, I wasn't run out of town or anything. Like, they didn't escort yeah. me to that. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you must go now. No, it wasn't like that. But it was just a bunch of, a series of personal kind of family situations that it was just time. I had to it went like this you ever had anything like that in your life where it's like this chapter closes this chapter closes. okay yeah. okay okay i can take it in okay it's time to go um yeah but uh, i'm playing back there in uh april 13th at the caswell with chris houston with uh the, oh, cool. yeah the punk uh punk uh legend chris houston my good friend as well so um so i'm doing a you know, tours uh, per se, no, not at this point. But one-off gigs, lots of, lots of. So they're all yeah. posted on my uh, website. And, and um, you know, I've pitched for a lot of um, festivals. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed and, and open or hopefully something comes in that I can do. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to get you out here in the East Oh, Coast. I would love to. Well, yeah, I think, I think I'm, you know, I'm – you know, I'm I'm thinking that I may just have to um, hit up a few of my friends and just say, hey, I'm coming your way. Put me on a house concert. I, I'm thinking I'm getting a lot of um, interest in house concerts, which I'm I'm fine with, yeah. and I I like I quite like I yeah I um so I thought that I you know could really actually do that um, maybe more than anything. And I'm, yeah. I'm good to do that, right? So well, when we get off the air, I got a couple of things I should suggest to you, actually. Okay. But we'll okay. get in, we'll get into that. Um, okay. I don't I don't I don't want to make promises on the air that no, I can't of course keep, not. but there's no, some no. things I might be able to recommend to you that I know right. about here. So right. but um no, it's great to see you putting out new music. It's awesome. Um I love the record. I think my favorite oh, song you. is Three Sisters. I love that song. Are you gonna say? Yeah, I love How Three come? Sisters. How come? I don't know, it's just I know you listen to the whole record and you're thinking, is there any other, how, how do you get better than this? And then you get the three sisters and you're just like, oh, wow, it keeps getting better. Look, I mean, yeah. it's one of those, I like it because yeah. I like those kind of CDs where, you know, you can just leave it on. You don't have to skip tracks. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, That's nice. You're, I think your writing is as good as it's ever been. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That and, means a lot. And that's that's what I'm trying to promote a lot with some of the interviews I've been doing. Like I interviewed mm -hmm. Barney Bentall a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, and I just I think he's writing better music now than he did right. when he was well known. Yep. And I really yep. like to I really like to promote that part and make people yeah. realize you should really yeah. check out what these guys yeah. are still doing because they're yeah, still doing yeah. good stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, I would agree. Like for myself, I think that people who do know me like. I'm a I'm a way better singer and I'm a way better writer, but yeah. I'm nowhere near as known as I was, right? Of course, that's yeah. just the way it goes. That's okay. That's okay. That's that's um that's who knows why that is. That's just that's maturity, I think. And and some some artists don't get to mature like that. They just don't um you know, they don't have that kind of um, I don't know, fortitude, I guess. Yeah. I mean with, with me I've kept at it because I, I love it. I love to write. And I, I love to sing. It's been a, a type of like, you know, selfish therapy for me, I yeah. guess, you know, and, um, and I, to hear, you know, my peers tell me that, you know, that my writing is better than ever, um, that I've really come into my own as a writer. That means a lot. That means a lot. I think more than anything, it's the writing, the singing. I feel like I've, you know, been an okay singer for a while and I still have to stay on top of it because as as you get older, your voice changes too. At least mine yeah, is yeah. a little bit. Um, and um, but the writing, uh, like I saw Paul Simon last night on, what was he on? Uh, what's that guy's name? One of the talk show hosts. And I don't know how he must be eighty, right, or something like. Got to be getting close to that. <laughs> but you should excuse me. You should hear the song he wrote. It was like wow, because at a certain he still point, got it. Yeah, and well, and also too, as songwriters, we're so. I think, without sounding too pompous, really, that we're we're supposed to be the reflection back to people, or the harbingers yeah. of things, right? Yeah. To be able to say maybe what people can't say, we say it in a song, right? So we're not all twenty one anymore. We're just yeah. not right, and things are going on in our lives that 
maybe we want to hear a songwriter say, like, you know, Lucinda Williams' record after her father died is a super powerful record. Yeah. Now, no one in my family had died yet, but I love that record. But I could, you know, and then after my mom died, I couldn't listen to it because it was just like, oh. Yeah. But I appreciate that that she would write about her experience. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of what I, I I'm interested in in artists. That's yeah. a musical artist, uh, artist, artist, um, as opposed to maybe, and I like pop stars too. <laughs> I yeah. do, right? I do, and I like pop music too. But I also I uh, really like when I see artists uh, progress or evolve, and I'm yeah. a little mystified when they don't, when they yeah, because I'm a bit like, huh? How can you? How can you not? Because because you do as a human, you're supposed yeah. to do as a human, right? Because you do your body is. Yeah. Your cells are like everybody's getting older if you're lucky to get older yeah i don't want to hear the same album over and over again by my favorite artists i want to hear them do something different like kind of right like and i yeah. guess i guess people maybe get caught like what's happened for me is because i've not had commercial success i've been given complete freedom because no one's paying attention right yeah and i can kind of do whatever i want to figure out whatever i want and that's as opposed to say any one of the records I made, had it struck big, I would have had a lot of pressure to make that record again. Yeah. That is what happens to artists, exactly. right? The company, the team, all of a sudden there's a lot of people on you to make that record again. And yeah. It's true. Like I I mean, we were I was showing you that I bought the new Getty Lee biography, and it's like there's a band that totally was did what they wanted to do and they they grew and they they tried stuff they experimented and it's what you yeah. want i don't want yeah. to hear 2112 over and over again right and then they make an album like moving pictures which is brilliant and totally different from 2112 yeah. but yeah. it just it just goes to show you know if you give if you give a chance to people and let them grow you know it's just it's it's they can keep making great stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, but then you never know where one of your songs are going to catch on too. Like, I mean, I think I heard the Sky Diggers in a commercial recently. Oh, that's nice. Isn't that something? Like, oh, I mean, that's nice, man. You know, that's the last band yeah. I expect to hear in a TV commercial. Like, but I mean, but yeah. I guess that's where you got to get your song out there. Sometimes it gets used in a TikTok video or well, something like that. You know, it used to be back in the 80s or 90s even. That it was, you know, oh no, oh no, I would never sell my music to a beer commercial. Now, the competition is so heavy. Yeah. That if it's like winning the lottery for anything like that, yeah. to have your song placed in a movie, commercial, anything, it really truly is. Stranger right? Things, right? With Kate Bush. Isn't that Kate, great Bush though? Kate Bush with Stranger Things. Yeah. yeah. It really is. I mean, I, I love that's my favorite record. That Kate Bush record is my favorite record. Oh, it's Wonderful. just just amazing yeah. to see someone like her make the comeback she did just because yeah. of using that song in yeah. in that in that episode. And it was just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And I think Corey Hart got a song used in that too, didn't he? I don't know, do you? I mean, I, 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 but you know, yeah, I guess that's the way you got to do it nowadays. That's the way to get a song. I mean, but you never know; it could happen. It could happen. Somebody if you're could making latch music, on. if you're making music and you're putting it out there, it can happen. If you're not, it can't. Right? Yeah. But That's yeah, I, I give you I give you one hundred percent credit for not stopping. Keep doing what you love. Oh, thanks. And you know what? Chances are someone else is gonna love it too. That's what I always say. And yeah, that's yeah. why I keep doing what I'm doing, not yeah. because I'm making money at it, because I I'm having fun. Yeah. Well, um, your your appreciation of it really shows, and and you're thorough, and you're, you know, you're you're honest, and you're earnest, and that's like that's why people want to talk to you because you're. You're you're true about it. Right? Thanks. I appreciate that very yeah, much. Yeah. Thanks Definitely. for joining me again, Laurie. It's great to talk to you again. Oh, for sure. You as well. You Good as luck well. with the album. I'm sure it's oh, going to do you. well. And hopefully we get you out here in the Maritime sometime. Oh, I'd love that. I would love it. All yeah. right. Take care, Laurie. Okay. Thank you. Bye.